Hey folks, welcome back to our Dice Tower Preview. I'm Mark. And I'm Randy. Today we're taking a look at Post-Human Saga. Post-Human Saga is brought to you by Mighty Boards. It plays one to four players, ages 14 and up, and each game takes between 30 minutes and two hours to play. Great, well, let's see who can be the most effective member of the fortress and survive the post-apocalyptic world. Post-Human Saga takes place one year after the original post-human game. We are now all members of the fortress in a militia team. However, we are all heading out separately to become one of the more valuable members of the fortress by searching and scavenging and avoiding becoming a mutant. Basically. Exactly. You're doing this so that you can go beyond the perimeter and try to reestablish uh, communications with these outposts that have become right. disconnected from the fortress. You'll do this by exploring uncharted terrain, mm -hmm. encountering both friendly and hostile characters, yep. uh, many of them, as you said, mutants, mutants, and trying to scavenge just to stay alive. The important thing is that although you all have a common goal, you have to establish yourself as one of the more valuable members because space in the fortress is limited Indeed. and you don't want to get kicked out. All right, there's a lot to set up in this game. We're going to give you kind of just a quick overview of what some of this looks like. You're going to take the main board and put it in the middle of the table. And then you're going to take the terrain tiles, shuffle them up, and create four piles. Now, you're going to place a number of tiles face up on the middle of the board based on the number of players in the game. And then you're going to take the scavenge tokens and place them around those tiles as well. And then you're going to take the recon objectives and you're going to put those cards out on the board. You're going to take your global events and put them out on the board. And then you're going to take your encounter decks, one and two, and place them next to the board. And then you have all your various cards from equipment to followers to mutations. And then you're gonna take all the various tokens, things like um, ammo and food and place those within easy access for all players. And then you're gonna take the dice and set those up as well, as well as all the various cubes for the different markers on the board. After you set up the main board and all the global components, each player should take one of these player mats. Now these are generic and we'll talk about the unique characters in a bit. But first we want to go over this because there's a lot of thing, e things each player needs to keep track of. Indeed. And this board helps you do that. Across the top there are spots to hold all the tokens you'll be using throughout right. the game. And you get different amounts of tokens based on what character you Exactly, have. exactly. Yeah. But before we talk about the specific characters, we'll talk about uh, what types of tokens you'll be using. Over here on the upper left is something they call broadcast mm -hmm. tokens. Uh, and this shows binoculars. These are the tokens you'll be using to bid to determine player order. Uh, next are the two spaces for your level one and level two mission objective tokens. Then there's a spot for establishing safe zone using safe zone tokens. Next to that are three spaces for the different type of recovery tokens. Yeah. And then tokens for ammunition and tokens for food. The ever coveted food. Yes, it's very <laughs> essential in the post-apocalyptic world. In the center you see a uh, different tracks for your different aspects of your character. Now, in this particular prototype, we'll be using cubes, but in the final product, this will be a pegboard, just yep. so you know. Uh, the top two are health and morale, and these will start further on the right, and next to them, you'll be using uh, pegs or cubes to keep track of your max health or morale, uh, and these are different depending upon the characters you choose. Uh, you can, these can go down all the way to zero, at which yes. point you'll be KO'd, but they can never go above your maximum. Right. Uh, below that, is fatigue, and fatigue is something that'll start on the left, and it'll make certain you keep it as low as possible, but there are consequences at each level of fatigue you achieve. Yeah, it's bad. It is. And then at bottom here is experience points. And again, you'll be using pegs for each one of these. Over here on the left is a space for the cubes you'll be using for stats boosts. Now, in addition to your, your character's skills and attributes, mm -hmm. you can get some additional cubes to help you boost them. They're, they're one-time things uh, until you recover them. Right. And over here on the right is where you put exhausted cards and exhausted cubes. Across the bottom is where you put equipment. Anything that's a heavier piece of equipment goes on the far right, mm -hmm. and characters are limited to how many of those they can carry. Right. And over on the far right is where you put your development cards. Now, these are things that you can spend experience points on. They have both level one and level two, and you can see these little icons that match the... Uh, upgrades. The, yes, they're basically upgrades. And these are also things that you can end up exhausting and mm -hmm. then recovering as well. So there, and something to keep in mind in this game, there's a difference between exhausting a card and discarding yeah, it. Totally. Exhausting it, we'll put it over here on the right, and you can recover it with some of the recovery tokens. Mm -hmm. Discarding it means it's out of the game. Yeah. So anyway, keep that in mind. And now let's talk about specific player characters. 
Next, each player chooses a specific character. There are currently four characters in Posthuman Saga. The order in which you choose them might be random, or whoever has been selected as first player might get to choose first. Right. In any case, we'll, we'll walk through an example using the scavenger characters. You can see kind of what some of the skills and, and <laughs> traits, how they're represented on the card. In the upper left, in the black icons, you see the initiative, the, the morale, and the health of that character, and you will set the pegs or cubes on your player mat accordingly based on those values. In the upper right, you'll see five different colored icons that represent the character's skill in shooting, in melee combat, strength, speed, and mind. And besides some of these, you'll see cubes or mm. icons that represent colored cubes, and these are skill boosts stats boost rather, that you will get cubes in those colors to put on the left side of your player mat that you can spend when you want to make certain... That you, you achieve something, Yes, right? so you'll, and it will contri it'll contribute a few points to, yeah. to that particular skill test. Uh, in the middle of the right card, you'll see some text um, that represents the starting items. Now, my character starts with a hunting knife, a Colt 9mm gun, two food, and three ammo. So your character uh, will get a number of cards that are character specific, and they will have that character's um, face depicted on the back of them. So this will include any starting weapons, like the gun and the knife that I've got. It will also include, if you look across the bottom, um, three development cards. These uh, yellow cogs represent level one development cards, and so I will take them and I will put them to the right of my player mat um, there are other ones I get. I also get a, uh, a stack of these, both level one and level two, that I can purchase using experience points later. Lastly, I get a, a deck of combat cards. Now these combat cards, uh, there are some basic combat cards, which I will start with. There's also ones with green tops. Yes, <laughs> these are ones that are mutations and you don't use initially, so you right. won't want to separate those out. But these you will use as part of your combat encounters. And they're not all bad mutations. No, no, no. And we'll talk about mutations in a second. Yeah. The last thing I want to mention uh, here before we talk about the um, things on the board itself are your action cards. Now, again, we talked about mutation cards versus normal ones. You will get seven, four of which are normal and don't have any green banner across the top. And these you will use to choose your actions at the same time as all the other players who are choosing their actions. So this allows some simultaneous action selection. Right. Um, but as mutations come into play, some of these yeah. mutated actions might be included as well. But we'll talk about that in, the, in a second. All right, now that you have your character and player board set up, you're going to again look at that initiative order. You're going to look at the player track on the board, and whoever has the highest initiative is going to place their character token first, and then so forth. And then everybody's going to take their character figure and place it at the start position in their zone. And you're going to take your intel tokens and populate your zone as well. And then finally, everybody gets a mission card. These mission cards have very specific things about how you're going to need to build out terrain in order to achieve those missions. And then there's a lot of story here that we'll try really hard not to spoil that for you. Posthuman Saga is played in a series of turns. Each turn consists of four phases. There's the event phase, there's the declare action phase, there's the resolve actions phase, and lastly, there's the night phase. Right. During the events phase, the first thing you do is move the turn marker up one space on the turn track. You will see by each of these circles, each, each turn, you'll see an icon which represents what type of event occurs during that particular turn. If there's a pair of binoculars in a circle, what this represents is a broadcast event. The first thing that happens during a broadcast event is players can use any of these broadcast tokens, the ones with binoculars on them, to bid for turn order. Or they don't have to use them. They don't have to yeah, use any at all. it's a blind bid. Yes, it's a blind bid. So everybody will choose a certain number, put in their hand, and simultaneously reveal them. Whoever has the most of these tokens will get to go first, and so on down the line. Right. Any Anybody who's, if there's a tie, those players will remain in the same order as they were previously. Now, once you've determined the new player order, what happens is that the person who is in the first position gets first pick of the tiles face up. Now, these, not only the tiles, but also the scavenged tokens right. next to them. And we'll explain why this is important uh, more in a bit, but the short story is both for getting points through your, uh, your level one, level two missions, as right. well as in the recon objectives, you uh, will want you'll have a preference over which of, which, of these you yeah. take. So if the more you want to strategize, the more you want to get just the right one to achieve your objectives, the more important it is for you to go first. So 
All players will get to choose a tile and a scavenge token. They will be limited to a total of four, both tiles and tokens right. in their hand at any time. So two of each or one of one tile and three tokens right. or vice versa. And they have to discard any above that. And the last thing that happens during a broadcast event is all these spaces are refilled based upon the number of players currently playing the game. The next type of event that can occur is shown by a, a lightning bolt here. If there is no player marker on here, what you'll do is you'll choose one of these event cards. Yes. And you'll see both an upper or a lower. What will happen if there's no player marker on here is you'll take one of these and you will read the, um, the global event at the right. bottom. Okay. And again, these are kind of story based. So we're not so going to give you we'll any show you, examples. We'll show yet. you one card, but we're not going to really dive into what these do. Now, if you have built on one of these, um, one of your Intel squares here, and I believe explored to put this your marker on this board, what this allows you to do is whoever has their marker on that space mm -hmm. gets to draw not one but two from right. this deck. Look at them both because what he's going to be reading is the upper half, not the lower half. He will choose the one of his preference, put the other one on the bottom of the deck, and then read that aloud to the group. So the benefit of getting an Intel token out there of yours mm -hmm. is that you get to choose between the events that are going on. The next type of token um, or type of uh, icon that's on an event square is the two on turn uh, seven. What that's what's going on there is hmm. players will no longer get to choose from the level one encounter deck. Right. They have to choose from the level two encounter deck, which is which is uh, much more difficult. Yes, indeed. And then the next one on turn eleven, you will be adding a particular mutant token to the bag, which has some dire consequences as well. Mutants are coming. <laughs> And then lastly, on turn 15, that is the game end. Yes. So if you haven't completed your objectives by then, uh, if you haven't ended it before this time, that is when the game will be over and you'll want to calculate your points. Next up is the action declaration phase. Everyone's going to pick an action and flip it over, and that's what they're doing this turn. So the thing we're going to look at first is explore. And basically what this does is allows you to use the move action, which you move to a new tile, you place it in your zone, and then you have to encounter that tile. And this is where you're gonna roll the dice. And you're going to try to beat uh, that threat level. And if you do beat the threat level, then you go to a narrative adventure. And we haven't really talked about the narrative much because we're trying really hard not to spoil the story. But there's a ton of different narratives that you have to deal with. It's not just flavor text. These narratives force you to make choices and you have to do certain things. So without spoiling anything. And there's a huge story bit that happens at the very beginning of the game as well. Now, if you don't meet that threat level in that dice roll, then you have to resolve a combat action, which there's various stages in this combat action. You have to do ranged weapons, you have to do melee, and so forth. Now, based on where you are at in the game will determine what encounter card you pull, a one or a two. Right. Now, when you pull these encounter cards, based on if you're doing the combat action, it'll tell you what you're battling, or if you're doing a narrative, it'll tell you what part of the story to go to. And then finally, at the end of the explore action, you're going to roll a loot die. And this is where you get goodies. You can either end up with food, ammo, maybe some equipment. You might get recovery tokens of any of the types, just based on what you roll on this dice. Now, Mark mentioned the combat phase, and we aren't going to go into that in great detail because right. there's some intricate mechanics there. There are. So the, the key thing to, to note is that one of the things, it's kind of a, a novel mechanic here, is that it does use this deck of combat cards. Right. And in addition to your natural skills and traits, you'll be able to choose, that's right, you'll be able to look through your deck and actually choose one uh, to use. And it's got both an upper half, which represents the ranged attack, and the lower half is the melee attack, you'll be able to choose one for each of those types of attack, as yep. well as getting one randomly uh, from from the deck, right. and you'll use those in tabulating your points as well. And the right. monster has his own way. He rolls Indeed, dice. He rolls dice. Yep. So you'll do your, your range attacks first, both of you will, and then you'll do uh, exchange your melee attacks. Yep. Now, the one that you chose, because you chose it, it will go into your exhausted pile here, yes. and that can be brought back into your deck through the process. But the random process. one goes back the to your The random deck. one gets shuffled back in automatically. Yeah. Now, the, the important thing here to note is that when you are uh, being attacked by uh, regular creatures or people, right. 
uh, like these wild dogs or maybe a normal human, uh, there's no chance of mutation. But if you see this little green <laughs> circle with claw marks on it, if you're injured by a mutant, there's a chance of you becoming mutated as well. In fact, if you're injured by a mutant, uh, you get to draw, get to draw, get to draw. Uh, from the mu uh, mutation decks. Yes, you, indeed. You start by, the first one you draw will be from the stable mutation deck. Yes. And those aren't always terrible. No, Sometimes actually. they involve uh, taking one mm -hmm. of these mutated cards, these mutated combat cards, and adding them to your deck. Now, um, as you, after your first one, though, yeah, yeah that, that can be starts, good. It, can it be bad. starts to get bad. Yeah, like. and that can also change the choices you have in your action cards, because as I right. said before, there are, for three of these, there are normal ver versions right. of the action, and then there's mutated versions. So, so um, in addition to, after you draw the first mutation from a, the stable deck, your second and third draws come from the unstable mutation deck. So yeah. anyway, this is something to keep in mind as you go into combat, both the, this mechanic of using these combat cards as well as the chance of, of getting Indeed. mutated, which impact the choices you've got It's in the okay game. to be mutated a little bit. Yeah, and sometimes that can give you skills. Yeah, yeah it really We've does. all seen the X-Men. We know That's mutation right. isn't bad. <laughs> in any case... When you complete this, yes. you don't have to kill the monster to complete the encounter. Right. If you complete it successfully, whether you've just exchanged um, combat blows and killed the monster, or you've just completed it. In fact, right. unless you're fighting a boss, you just exchange one, one round. Ra run round of combat. Yep. After that, you get experience points. And these are very important because you can spend them during the night phase yes. for some of these upgrades we talked right. about. But before we talk about the night phase, let's talk about some of the other actions that we can choose during the uh, right. second and third phases here. And it's also important to note that if you did a narrative instead, you're still going to get experience exactly. for That's that. True. It's not just combat that you He's get experience right. for. He's right. Another type of action is forage. And it does allow you to move, but really the focus of forage is getting good. So based on the terrain that you're on, will determine what type of good you'll get. So for instance, if you're in the city, you're gonna get weapons. In addition to explore and forage, there are two other actions you can choose. The first is map. A map allows you to do a couple of things. First choice is you can get a, a couple of broadcast tokens for you to use in future rounds when you're bidding for player order, or you can replace all face-up tiles and scavenger tokens uh, that are currently in the center of the board. After you've done that, you have the option of, of choosing one of those tiles and scavenge tokens, and then putting down any number of tiles and up mm. to one scavenge token per tile on your in your player zone. So if you really want to uh, expand the map in your area, this is a good way of doing it. It's much better than the move action, which is embedded in Forage and uh, explore right. because those only allow you to put down one tile for each of those actions. This you could put down as many tiles as you have in your hand. The last action you can choose is camp. Now, uh, if you choose to camp in a general area, you get three recovery tokens of your choice. If you're camping in a safe zone, you actually get four. And again, these can be very useful in improving your stats, recovering health, for example, or recovering um, your, your morale. It can also help you recover things that have currently been exhausted and are sitting on the right side of your player right. map. And then finally, after you do all your actions, then we move to the night phase. And in the night phase, you get you all you need to eat. You need to eat, that's right. Eat. Or take uh, some fatigue and suffer potential consequences yeah. of that. And you also have the opportunity to spend your XP right. to get upgrade cards. Right, so that's a very key thing as well, as you might find some upgrade cards that level one you can buy any time. Uh, twos, uh, level twos have some restrictions on when yeah. you can buy them. The last thing that happens during the night phase is there are some effects that on your cards that will trigger during the night phase. Right. So you want to be aware of those. Indeed. So it's it's always advantageous to be in a safe zone if you can pull it off. Absolutely. Now your mission cards have a level one and a level two mission. And once you complete the level two, then you're going to draw a boss card. And you have to deal with these bosses in several rounds. So you're going to do a shooting round, basically. Right. Uh, and the range round, and then you're going to do three rounds of melee. Yeah, this is this is different than the usual creature you encounter, yes. where you just do one round of range and one round of melee. In this case, for the boss, and only for the boss, you would do three rounds of melee. And if you survive that, that's one of the game. That's the game in trigger, right? Really. That's one. Yeah, at that time, you complete that particular turn. And uh, multiple players could complete their boss yeah. encounter during the same, same turn, turn because maybe Mark and I both chose to explore a particular mm -hmm. terrain type. Now, we should mention you do have the option when you do an explore of not 
choosing the boss. Right. You could choose to do a regular encounter with a regular monster. And you might do that because you don't feel like you're geared up for the monster yet. Or um, there may be other points that you're trying to get, such as the recon right. uh, objectives as well. But um, when you, the first person to complete his level two uh, and complete his boss then uh, triggers the last turn of the game. Right. Now, when the game end has been triggered either by one or more players completing their level two mission objective and surviving their encounter with their boss, or by reaching turn 15 and that triggering the end of the game, players then count up the total number of reputation points they have. Right. We haven't talked a lot about how reputation points are accumulated during the game, but we'll do that now. The primary ways you get them are through completing your mission objectives on your mission objective card, as well as completing the recon objectives on the recon objective card that was uh, selected at the beginning of the game. Let's talk first about the mission objectives, level one and level two. You'll see for level one, you'll see three circles, two small ones and a large one. And for level two, you'll see uh, three small circles and one large one. What this indicates are the, the terrain types you have to explore yes. as, and uh, put down flag tokens, basically, for uh, each of those objectives. Uh, the small ones can be completed in any order, and you see in my level one objective here, you see I need to complete a um, uh, any terrain type, explore right. any terrain type, and a force, and I can do those again in any order. When I explore successfully, on that terrain type, I would put down one of these level one objective tokens, and when I do, I get uh, a, um, a basically a, a reputation point there. You see that in the, in the little star there, a one there. Uh, and so let's say I did a mountain first, and then I did a uh, the, the forest that's required. Once I've done the small circles, I can do the final objective terrain, and if I succeed at that, I get to put down this, uh, this it's slightly different token because in addition to having a star with a question mark, it's got a safe zone yes. marker. Now, that zone or that tile becomes a safe zone and something we didn't mention earlier, but during the night phase, yeah. if you're in a safe zone, you don't have to eat any food. Yeah. If you're anywhere else, you do or you gain some fatigue. So there, there's definitely benefits of having established a safe zone. Whereas the first two tokens give me one reputation point each. The uh, final objective token for level one has a question mark on it. And what that indicates is that I get uh, points depending upon how, um, what order I completed this in. So if I was the first person, if you look over right. here on the uh, mission objective track, I will get four points if I'm the first person to complete my level one objective. Right. Uh, and then down to two if I'm second, one, one. if I'm third, and then zero, zero if I'm fourth. Yeah, yeah. yeah so that's, uh, that encourages you, you to be the early bird. Go fast. Yeah. And then the same thing is true for level two, except instead of having two small circles, you have three small circles. Right. Again, complete them in any order. And then again, you have a final objective token that, that uh, you'll get points for based upon how early you were in completing that objective. Now, the other way to get points is by completing the recon objectives. And the way you do that, as you're placing terrain tiles, you can also be placing uh, scavenge tokens. And you're trying to basically trace out these particular scavenge tokens as the recon uh, outlines here. Yeah. So you're following this path, and they have to follow a path, right? Yeah. Now it can be. It doesn't have to be a straight line. No. Uh, in order to achieve this, it could be, be an, an L shape. It could be an L shape or a Z but or it has even to a be square. In sequence. Exactly. And just based on what level you do here, you can go anywhere from one to five points on this particular card. Right. And the longer the path, the more points you get. Indeed. Obviously. And then finally, you can exchange experience for reputation. Right. Five experience points equals one reputation point. And whoever has the most reputation wins, wins the, game. the game. All right, folks, once again, just a reminder, this has been a Dice Tower paid preview, and everything you've seen here has been in prototype form. So all the rules and artwork and everything could still be in flux, so keep a close eye on the campaign for any changes. Now, with that said, you know, I really like... Uh, this type of theme in a game, you know, the post-apocalyptic. And it's not <laughs> zombies, right? Right now for a change, they're not. Yeah, not yeah. zombies, so that's nice. And the thing I like about it is the fact that you can become a mutant, just like the original post-human game. Yes. And that changes the way you play the game. In yeah. fact, in the first game, uh, if you became a mutant, you can say, oh, just... I'm, I'm going full tilt mutant and I'm going to kill all my friends and I win the game that way. <laughs> so it changes your win conditions. In this uh, case, it does change the way you play if, yeah. if you become sufficiently mutated. But even if you're not very mutated, you might get additional skills that, yeah, that kind of change pretty, the way the game is played. Pretty cool, yeah. actually. Yeah. So 
If, folks, if this looks like a game that would be of interest to you, I'm sure they'd appreciate your support. That's right. I think that's it from us. That is. Until next time, we'll, we'll see you at the table. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews, as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool Stuff, in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com.